Jacqueline Jackie Cochran had an amazing career. Born in the remote swampy reaches of northern Florida, she never really knew who her parents were. Barefoot and unschooled, she was raised by a family friend in total poverty until, as a young teenager, she apprenticed herself to a hairdresser. From that unpromising beginning, she developed a chain of beauty shops and launched a personally owned and hugely profitable cosmetics empire. Encouraged by her soon-to-be husband, millionaire Floyd Udlam, she decided to learn to fly as an efficient means of expanding her business across the country. She soon became passionate about it. Wealthy and intensely competitive by nature, she found herself with the means and the will to begin some really serious flying. When she began taking lessons in 1932, she said, A beauty operator ceased to exist and an aviator was born. Cochran soloed on her third day of flying lessons, and after a mere three weeks, she earned her pilot's license and began her journey to become a legend in aviation history. Less than a year later, this beautician turned aviatrix entered her first air race, and by 1934, she was working as a test pilot. Not only was Cochran testing new state-of-the-art engines and avionics, but she was already setting records as the first person to fly above 20,000 feet wearing an oxygen mask. In 1935, she entered the Bendix race, a cross-country race from Los Angeles to Cleveland, Ohio. But she was denied entry to the race, which was for men only. Cochran protested the decision, stating that, I can't give up. If I concede on this, women will be barred from racing for years, maybe even forever. That year, Jackie Cochran and Amelia Earhart became the first women to compete. Although Cochran did not complete her first race due to mechanical problems, in 1937 she came in third, and she won the race in 1938. That same year, she was awarded the William E. Mitchell Award for making the greatest contribution to aviation over the course of the year. I went to England in uh, 1941, and the reason I got to fly to England, General Arnold called me one day and he said, Jackie, how would you like to fly some bombers to England? And I said, I'd be delighted, roll them out. Then the British asked me if I could recruit some women pilots, and I recruited 40 acts and 25 made the grade. General Arnold came over in June 1942 and said, uh, how about coming home and training a bunch of women? Fiercely determined, Jackie Cochran went on to recruit more than 1,000 women, building and commanding the famed Women's Air Force Service Pilots, the WASPs. These pioneer aviators proved that they could do the job and then some. Originally assigned to fly single-engine airplanes, these women demonstrated that they could also handle fast pursuit ships and four-engine bombers on transcontinental ferry flights. Cochran boldly exploited her friendship with General H.H. H. Hap Arnold, Chief of the Army Air Corps, and made herself the first woman to fly a bomber across the North Atlantic Ocean. The WASPs were disbanded in 1944. Thirty-three years later, the WASPs finally achieved full military recognition when President Jimmy Carter signed a law officially designating them as veterans. Jackie Cochran was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal for service to her country during World War II. After the war, flying was still her passion, and with the onset of the jet age, there were new planes to fly and more records to break. Here at Edwards Air Force Base, Major Chuck Yeager drew the assignment of checking Jackie out in the F-86 and then flying chase during her record attempts. Cochran was a superb pilot and her transition to jet aircraft was rapid. Flying ability was the only way to win Jaeger's esteem, and it was not long before he felt genuine respect for her cockpit skills. She became the first woman to break the sound barrier in an F-86 Sabrejet. I'm also very happy to have been the first woman to go through the sound barrier, the sound barrier, and also to do this in company with the first man. And set the world absolute speed record of 1,429 miles per hour in the F-104 Starfighter. Cochran blazed through the Edwards skies in a T-38 Talon to establish eight new world flight records, including speed over a 1,000 kilometer closed course, 639 miles per hour, distance in a straight line, 1,492 miles, and sustained altitude, 56,071 feet. Jackie called the Talon, the greatest step forward in the history of pilot training. Cochran continuously sought new challenges, and she was determined to ride the F-104 Starfighter to its limits, which was dubbed by many the missile with a man in it. The problem was to find a way for a civilian woman to fly the Air Force's hottest jet fighter, 
but Lockheed solved this by making one of its new F-104Gs available to her. The G model was the multi-role, all-weather version of the Starfighter developed for foreign air forces. On the 104, I had five records, three one time and two another time a year apart. And people think I've had a lot of time in the 104. I've had a total of, if I stretch my imagination, 50 hours with five records. In the 1960s, she established 69 more jet records, many of which were flown in the Starfighter. She set three new world records in barely a month, and Cochran was well over 50 years old by then. Jackie was truly an amazing pilot. Small wonder that many of her flight records are still unbroken 40 years later. At a ceremony at the White House in early 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower presented Jackie Cochran with the Harmon Trophy for the Outstanding Female Pilot of 1953. Major Chuck Yeager also received the Male Pilot Trophy for that year, and the two superb pilots went on to become lifelong friends. Although Cochran's achievements are too numerous to list, she was also the first woman commissioned as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Air Force Reserve. She earned the USAF Distinguished Flying Cross, was inducted to the National Aviation Hall of Fame, and named an honorary fellow to the Society of Experimental Test Pilots. When Jackie Cochran died in 1980, she had established more speed, altitude, and distance records than any other pilot, male or female, in aviation history. As an aviation pioneer, she was an inspiration to men and women alike. The word can't was never in Jackie's vocabulary. She believed airplanes couldn't tell the difference between a man and a woman, only a good pilot from a bad one. Her legend lives on in the countless women she inspired. Women who grew up looking toward the sky, dreaming of flying, and knowing that they could live that dream. Cochran went after records. I didn't want to be the fastest woman. I just wanted to be the fastest, period. She transformed the aviation community and paved the way for future generations. From a world where female military aviators were unheard of, to a world where men and women work side by side as pilots, navigators, flight test engineers, boom operators, and even astronauts. As with so many other aviation pioneers, Jackie's career has been commemorated by the naming of a street after her at Edwards Air Force Base. And I will be there on the aerial sidelines cheering with my last breath those who are carrying on. It's 1942, and America has yet to get over the shock of Pearl Harbor. President Roosevelt is in his third term. Radio is king, and the Yankees are in the running for the World Series. America is at war, and national defense is first priority as everybody does their share. Women are doing men's jobs, and 1942 is proving to be a frightening year as the war takes its toll on America's manpower and an alternate source of pilots is needed. To meet this critical need, experienced women pilots were recruited to free men for air combat duties overseas. A program was established to train these women to ferry aircraft in the States, and later to tow targets and test aircraft. This program was organized by Jackie Cochran, the first woman to break the sound barrier. I don't think the program would have ever been without her. And I, for one, had tremendous admiration and respect. The woman was dynamite. She knew what the goals were, and she was the one lady that could see it through. And at the time, I was trying desperately to get into the WASP, but I was already under contract to the government in a wartime training service. So I had to complete that contract before I could get in. 
when they took me down to the depot in L.A. to put me on the train to go to training in Texas, my father reached over with tears in his eyes and said, as long as you're going to do it, you'd be the best pilot they ever had. The first recruits began training in a contract school at the airport in Houston, but were soon moved to better facilities at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, the only female airbase in history. The only thing I would say that all of us had in common was the desire to do as much flying as possible in as heavy and fast uh, an aircraft as we could possibly manage and hoped that we could, could use this ability uh, to help with the war effort. Fortunately, it turned out we were able to do that. We had doctors, we had models, we had actors, actresses. Uh, if, if you went through their applications, you'd find just about every profession listed. But the one thing we had in common was this burning desire to continue flying in higher horsepower aircraft. That was the whole name of the game. And to think that we could do, at least this was my feeling, that I could fly at the same time as doing something for my country, I just felt that was the best. I'm Nancy Cruz, mayor of California City, and this is my Super Cub. As a wasp in World War II, the different missions I flew and the pursuit planes. Uh, mostly, I used to pick up uh, P-47s at the Republic factory on Long Island, and we ferry those to uh, Newark, New Jersey, which was an embarkation point. Also, we took planes uh, to the East Coast. I ferried uh, A-20s to uh, California, and then I would take uh, P-51s to South Carolina, and we went all over the United States. And some people think uh, we may have taken planes overseas, but we didn't. Uh, the men flew overseas missions, and so we really didn't have any dangerous missions as such. We flew in uh, good weather conditions, and we didn't fly at night. No, no instrument flying. Uh, those were really interesting days, but uh, right now I'm just as glad to be here in California City flying my good old Super Cub. Uh, we came in to land a little wasp and an AT-6 sandwiched in between P-40s and Grumman's and aircraft-based planes of the Navy and um, got down and very wearily walked into the operations room with the suitcase and uh, this big burly Navy pilot came in right behind me and said, where's that little gal that just landed in that SNJ out there, number so-and-so? He had my number. So I'm sitting on the floor over in the side of the room, and so me. So he came over and he stuck out a big paw and said, let me shake your hand. Who taught you to land an airplane the way the Navy does it? In 1977, the Air Force graduated its first group of female pilots. This brought mixed feelings from members of the WASP. So it irritated me just a wee bit that the news media didn't uh, get around to admitting that the WASP were indeed first. By the fall of 1944, the WASP non-combat flying duties included ferrying three-fourths of all domestic deliveries of American planes. On December 20th, 1944, the WASP deactivated. And 36 years later, the women Air Force service pilots were finally granted veteran recognition for their service during World War II. grazing the broad blue skylight up where the falcons fare, riding the realms of twilight brushed by a comet's hair, snug in my coat of leather, watching the skyline swing, shedding the world like a feather from the tip of a tilted wing. There are trails that I can travel when the years of my life wane, but I'll let a rainbow ravel through the wings of my silver plane. Gentlemen, dying today as guest of the cadet wing is Miss Jacqueline Cochran, holder of several speed and altitude records, winner of the Collier Trophy for outstanding accomplishments, and first lady to fly faster than the speed of sound. A great part of our heritage 
is represented by this young lady next to me and these wonderful, wonderful trophies and other memorabilia. Representative, I think, of one of the finest careers of any man, woman, or child in the history of this great country of ours. I soloed the first time in 1932, and I had never seen an airplane on the ground until Saturday morning, and I soloed Monday morning. I went to England in uh, 1941, and the reason I got to fly to England, General Arnold called me one day, and he said, Jackie, how would you like to fly some bombers to England? And I said, I'd be delighted, roll them out. Then the British asked me if I could recruit some women pilots, and I recruited 40, actually, and 25 made the grade. General Arnold came over in June 1942 and said, uh, how about coming home and training a bunch of women? And train them she did. From September 1942 to December 1944, just over 1,100 lady pilots graduated and went on to fly the best aircraft the Army Air Force had to offer. On the 104, I had five records, three one time and two another time, a year apart. And people think I've had a lot of time in the 104. I've had a total of, if I stretch my imagination, 50 hours with five records. And the fastest one was 1492, I think, or something. Anyway, I made one run that was 1507. General Allen, Mrs. Allen, my beloved husband, Floyd Odlum, my longtime friend, Chuck Yeager. I probably have flown with Jackie uh, more than any other guy. And, and the one thing that really impressed me is, is that Jackie can land an airplane as well as any guy or woman that I've ever flown with. Jackie started a long time ago lobbying for a separate Air Force. And she's always been real adamant about maintaining high standards in the women of our Air Force. And, well, she is, that's, she's dedicated to flying. Ms. Cochran, and on behalf of the cadet wing, and for your tremendous contributions to aviation, and also for the mementos which you have presented to our school, we'd like to present you with something that means a lot to us, and that's the Sabre Plaque Award. Gentlemen, I've been very fortunate to have been given an opportunity to serve our nation on, on so many occasions. And long period during the war, as General Arnold was my boss. I can't talk today. These are two of the most important things that ever happened in my whole life. Thank you.